Now, depending on who you talk to, vaccines are either the greatest triumph of humankind or its most dangerous endeavor. The history of vaccines and vaccinology is really most extraordinary. Unarguably, the most effective public health tools that we've developed. Two million lives per year that are saved. So my question is this, how did we get here and what is the truth? Are vaccines safe and should we submit ourselves to this kind of medical intervention? And in order to get at this, let's break it down into three sections. Number one, the discovery and development of vaccines. Number two, the rise of the anti-vaccination movement. And number three, should we get vaccinated? Now, before we talk about vaccination, we have to talk about disease. Our planet is positively saturated with little microbes, and in the course of world history, they have had a massive impact on the human race. Diseases like smallpox and measles and yellow fever provide the material for some of the most enduring turning points of history. Here we can recall the devastation of the Black Death in Europe, which was responsible for wiping out something like a quarter to a third of Europe's population, which would be the equivalent of 50 times the number of deaths we've seen so far from COVID-19. Team worldwide. We should also remember that when Christopher Columbus and other Europeans after him landed their ships in the Caribbean and then in South America and Mesoamerica, they introduced smallpox and measles, which in some cases decimated 90 to 95 percent of certain native populations. Add to that diseases like hepatitis, polio, the flu, rabies, yellow fever, all have left millions dead in their wake. So the problem of disease has been a persistent scourge of humanity since the dawn of time. But human beings have not simply accepted this reality passively. And here's where I tell you the astonishing history of the development of vaccines. Now, the first guy most people think about in the history of vaccination is Edward Jenner, who carried on his work near the end of the 18th century. But the work of fighting against disease goes back much farther than him, something like a thousand years ago. According to the Taoist tradition, the ancient Chinese medical community had been practicing something called nasal insufflation since about 1000 AD. And nasal insufflation is a fancy sounding word for what in reality is actually a disgusting sounding practice. In order to combat smallpox, the Chinese would scrape infected scabs from sick people, dry them out, ground them into powder, and then blow the powder up the noses of healthy children and adults. And for people who underwent this trial by scab blowing, they would not get sick when smallpox arrived in their community. Now, how they figured this out, I have no idea. But the point is they did figure it out and it conferred a strong degree of immunity against one of the most deadly and dreaded diseases ever known. Now, at some point, the method of inoculation changed from scab blowing to inserting the infected material into a scratch on the arm. In Africa, this became the prime method of protecting against disease. And one of the main reasons the Western world became aware of it was because of the African slave trade. Case in point, the colonial minister Cotton Mather. He owned an enslaved man whom he named Onesimus, and Mather asked Onesimus whether he had ever been infected with smallpox, to which Onesimus said, well, yes and no. And then Onesimus went on to describe the common practice in Africa of inserting a small dose of the disease into a scratch on the arm, which caused only mild symptoms and then conferred immunity from there on. And then Onesimus instructed Mather on the proper procedures for carrying out the operation. Now, this astonished Mather, and from then on, he became a tireless proponent of what was called variolation in the Massachusetts its colony. And now we finally come to Edward Jenner, who is actually the collector and popularizer of many other people's work on this front. In the 18th century, several folks throughout Europe had made similar observations about milkmaids, which is to say the ladies who milked the cows. Not only were their faces exceedingly smooth in a time when scarring from smallpox was fairly common, it was discovered that they were able to care for people sickened by smallpox without themselves getting infected. And so as Jenner started gathering all this information, the discovery he made was nothing less than astonishing. The reason the milkmaids were immune from smallpox is because they had previously been infected with cowpox. It wasn't unusual for cows to be infected with this pathogen and then develop pustules on their udders and so it wasn't unusual for milkmaids to become infected with that disease as they did their work. And so just stop and think about that for a second. Cowpox provided protection against smallpox. That is incredible. And so armed with that knowledge, Jenner began working tirelessly to vaccinate the population against smallpox. And so Jenner discovered what the Africans and the Chinese had known for centuries, namely that by infecting a person with a weakened version of a disease, that will confer immunity against the stronger version of a disease. Except instead of using the same disease, Jenner was able to do it with a different yet similar disease. Now let me just take a parenthetical moment here to explain in basic terms why this worked. 
Basically, when a pathogen enters the body, it seeks out cells in which it can reproduce itself and then find other cells in which the reproduction can continue. Now, our bodies have a defense system against such an attack, and the key players are B cells and T cells. B cells attack pathogens that are outside of cells by creating antibodies, and then T cells attack cells that have already been infected. Now, both of these kinds of cells are exceedingly adept at recognizing entities which should not be in our body, and when they do, the attack begins. Now, what's further astonishing is that while the cells are working to eliminate the threat, they are also producing memory cells, which store the information for that particular kind of virus or bacteria, so that if it ever shows up again, they can mount a quicker and more targeted response. So that's why variolation and vaccination work. Your immune system is introduced to a pathogen in a weakened form, and then the body is able to conquer that sickness relatively easily, and then develops a memory for any future infections. I mean, if you let it, that ought to blow your mind. Anyway, in the 19th century, vaccination continued to develop in the hands of Louis Pasteur, who developed a vaccine for cholera using a weakened form of the virus. He went on to do the same thing for rabies and then for anthrax. And then in Germany, Wilhelm Kohle developed a vaccine for typhoid. And he discovered that this vaccine was successful even when it was constructed around a dead version of the virus. Like, I don't know about you, but the fact that human beings figured that out is amazing. And the results of their work are likewise amazing. In the decade before General work, there were 18,447 deaths recorded from smallpox in England. In a decade after, it was 7,858, which is a 76% reduction in deaths. In 1874, Germany passed a mandatory smallpox vaccination law, and over the next decade, the annual mortality rate was 1.91 deaths per 100,000 people. Compare that to neighboring Austria, whose vaccination requirements were far more lax. In the same period, the number of deaths from smallpox varied from 39 to 94 per 100,000 thousand per year. And I could go on and show you similar statistics from every nation that put such measures in place. Vaccination was nothing less than a miracle for those that accepted it. And even as I say that, you might be wondering, why in the world would anyone oppose a medical intervention that was both so astonishingly discovered and responsible for saving so many lives? Now, historically, there have been three basic reasons why people have mounted a resistance to vaccines. Number one, religion. Number two, reaction to government control. And number three, fear of bodily harm. With respect to religion, this was basically a Christian objection. In 1722, an English preacher by the name of Edmund Massey preached a sermon in which he argued that diseases are ordained by God, quote, if not for the trial of our faith, for the punishment of our sins. Therefore, in his estimation, tampering with disease was a, quote, diabolical operation. Similarly, over in America, a preacher named John Williams excoriated Cotton Mather's enthusiasm for inoculation, calling it the devil's work. In response to Edward Jenner's work, further religious objections were raised on account of the unnatural practice of injecting animal cells into the human body. This particular objection went so far as to argue that people, now laden with cow cells would develop into cows themselves. So that's one reason people have rejected vaccination. The second reason is a reaction to government control and the infringement on personal liberty. Now, it's not hard to understand why governments would want to get involved with vaccination. Since disease has always been such a persistent killer of its citizens, then imposing a cure for those diseases seems like a no-brainer. Well, in 1853, the United Kingdom passed a mandatory vaccination act, and apparently the British public was none too happy about the government forcing a needle in their arms, so to speak. And so in 1885, between 80,000 and 100,000 people gathered for a protest against this policy. And the number of people who showed up is disputed. The point is, it was a lot of people. A sympathizer with the cause, Alfred Wallace, wrote the thesis for the rebellion, saying, Every day the vaccination laws remain in force. Parents are being punished. Infants are being killed. Over in America, about 50 years later, the Supreme Court heard arguments about mandatory vaccination. It was a case in 1902 called Jacobson versus Massachusetts. Now, Henning Jacobson was a resident of Massachusetts which had responded to an outbreak of smallpox by mandating vaccination. He refused and was therefore fined. Once the case worked its way to the Supreme Court, a decision was handed down that said, although individual liberty is important, public safety was more important. They said that when Jacobson exercised his personal liberty to reject vaccination, he was effectively endangering other people's lives and thus trespassing on their personal liberties. Therefore, mandatory vaccination was upheld in Massachusetts. Now, the third reason people have historically 
automatically reject a vaccination is because of the fear of real harm being done to them. And make no mistake, vaccinations can do real harm to people. In fact, the CDC has a running list of vaccine side effects on their website, which include anaphylaxis, brachial neuritis, encephalopathy, and other very scary sounding conditions. Now, to be clear, all of those side effects are extraordinarily rare, but they are possibilities nonetheless. And then in 1998, a medical researcher by the name of Andrew Wakefield published a study in a revered medical journal called The Lancet in which he laid the groundwork for the current manifestation of the anti-vaccination movement. In his study, Wakefield reported that the MMR vaccine routinely given to infants was the cause of autism. And upon publication of this paper, MMR vaccination in the UK dropped precipitously from 1996, in which 96% of the population was vaccinated, to 2003, when in some parts of London, only 61% of the population was vaccinated. Now, the CDC information about side effects is real. But here's where I tell you that Andrew Wakefield's study connecting MMR to autism was patently and perniciously false. First of all, his study sample was embarrassingly small, 12 children, only eight of which claimed a link between MMR and autism. Second, it was discovered that every family who had participated had something in common. Every one of them were suing vaccine manufacturers on the grounds that their vaccines caused their children's autism. So the lawyer representing them hired Andrew Wakefield to prove that connection. Once all this information was exposed, Wakefield's license was stripped and The Lancet retracted his paper. But the damage had already been done, and thanks to some high-profile celebrities who latched on to this false research, the fear that vaccines cause autism persists today. And on this count, I cannot help myself but share with you what Eula Biss said about this in her book On Immunity. Those who went on to use Wakefield's inconclusive work to support the notion that vaccines cause autism are not guilty of ignorance or science denial so much as they are guilty of using weak science as it has always been used to lend false credibility to an idea that we wanted to believe for other reasons. So having explored the history of vaccinations and the anti-vaccination movement, the question remains, are they safe and should we get vaccinated? The answer to their safety is yes, they are safe. I can't survey the entirety of the medical literature for you here, but the sum of it is this. Despite very rare side effects, vaccines are safe and save millions of lives every year. Listen, you are far more likely to die of the disease than die of vaccination or even experience side effects from vaccination. And I'm not just making that up. In 2011, a study was published in which a large committee of experts in various fields related to immunology spent two whole years reviewing 12,000 peer-reviewed papers and came to this conclusion. The overwhelming majority of evidence tells a single story. Vaccines are safe and they save countless lives. And if that's the case, then why is anybody still resisting them? And that reminds me of a famous illustration in moral philosophy known as the trolley problem. The scenario goes like this. You're at the controls of a speeding trolley whose brakes have failed. Ahead of you is a fork in the track, and on one side of the track you're currently traveling on, five people are working on the track and will die when you hit them. On the other track, there's only one worker. You don't have brakes, but you do have the ability to switch tracks. So the question is, do you pull the lever and aim the trolley at the single worker or do nothing and let five workers die? Now, many researchers have studied people's responses to this problem, and in 96 to 97% of the cases, people choose to pull the lever and switch the track. Better to intentionally kill one, they reason, than to kill five. But what's interesting is that there's an alternative scenario in the trolley problem. In this case, it's the same trolley and the same five workers on the track. But in this scenario, you're on a bridge and the only way to stop the trolley is by pushing the man in front of you onto the tracks. Now consider this, it's the exact same outcome, intentionally sacrificing one for the sake of saving five others. But when the scenario is presented in this manner, the results are completely the opposite. Only two to 3% of respondents say that they would push the man off. So what's the difference between these two scenarios? It's the human element. People are far more likely to pull a mechanical lever to switch tracks. What they won't do is put their hands on another human being and push them to their death. And here's how I think this relates to our national conversation about vaccines. Those who are in favor of them rightly parade the data and science in front of us and say, 
Look, how could you be so selfish in the face of these numbers? To them, the problem of vaccination is all about the mechanical lever. The calculations are clear. Just pull it. I think what they don't realize is that they're not talking to people in the trolley with their hand on the lever. They're actually talking to people who are standing on the bridge. And instead of having to contemplate pushing a man onto the tracks, it's their children who stand there. It's a human decision for them, not a mechanical one. The spotlight has been focused on the dangers of vaccines. It doesn't matter that the incidence of injury and death from car accidents is far more likely to harm their child. Like, that's not what they're focused on. So no amount of data crunching is going to convince them. They're real people with real children who harbor real fears about things unknown. And look, talking about data is a good thing because these are real numbers that represent thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hours of research done by very smart folks whose aim is to eradicate suffering and disease from our population. But we will never get anywhere in this conversation until we realize that there are humans on both sides of this dialogue. And if that's true, then what is required of us is to hear each other with compassion. All right, I'm very grateful that you took the time to watch this. I'm very interested in starting a conversation about this topic, so let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Subscribing to this channel is the signal that you can give me that you want me to keep making these videos, so if that's what you want, then you know you know what to do. A big thanks to Eileen Brannick, whose research was indispensable to me on this. Also thanks to the Paul Family Foundation, whose generous support made the creation of this video possible. We'll see you in the next one.